Athena House. October 7th, 2004. Tenth for friends and families of Mark. As promised, here are the copies of the correspondence I received from Mark over the course of the last month. For the most part, I have merely copied and po pasted them from my email application. As you read, he requested this in hopes that you better understand why he did what he did. I made this site because it's the most efficient way to share Mark's emails with all of you. I'm not advertising this to anyone, but I do not think it will help. It would be wise to pass this URL along to anyone who may help with the investigation. As I collect more information from various sources, I'll update this site to keep it an accurate record. I'll have that link at the end of the series as well. If you need to speak with me, Jen has my number. Thank you for your patience. And again, I am profoundly sorry. Eric. September 6, 2004. From Conjury Mark. Date. Monday, September 6, 2004. 8.17 a.m. Subject, an old friend. Eric, hey man, it's Mark from Houston. This is a, this is a Saturday night gang. Feels like it's a long time, long time ago, doesn't it? I found your email from your site. Looks like you're out in LA now. Cool. I remember telling you you should be out there doing the California thing. You still with Connie? I'm in Dallas now. I met someone who works in my building. We've been seeing each other for two years now. Listen, the reason I'm writing to you out of the blue is because I got a newspaper article in the mail. Maybe you got one too. It's about Andrew. You remember Drew? Travis would pick him up most of the time. Messy hair, sort of the fanboy type. I didn't remember his last name until I got this thing. And now it's really disturbed me. me. Did you know what happened? Did you hear about it already? Let me know if you have some time to talk. I can call you or you can call me if that works better. I'm going to, s going to see if I can track down Travis or and Dave. A quick search didn't seem to turn up any leads. But maybe they, they just don't have any websites. If you still talk to either, then let me know. Thanks, Mark. September 8th, 2004. From Conjury, Mark. Date, Wednesday, September 8th, 2004, 7.44 a.m. Subject, free and old friend. Eric, thanks for, for a quick reply. I didn't mean to sound cryptic in my first email. I'm just reluctant to guess, I guess. I hadn't really seen or thought about Andrew since he stopped showing up for the game night. And that was five years ago. That was about the time we all went on our, our own ways. Back in 1999, he moved out west. I moved up to Dallas, etc. So when I got this article in my mailbox, it caught me by surprise. And yeah, I'll transcribe the thing for you. I, I wasn't sure if maybe you were the one who sent it to me. I'll put it, it into this email at the bottom. I remember him. He was never the kid with the idea he was. The kid who agreed with yours. Slow as to get the joke, usually. Laughed the longest. That's Andrew in a nutshell. Yeah. At least that's how I remember him. He got on my nerves sometimes, but damn. If he didn't love being part of the gang, he'd ask me for some poker chips on card night or borrow dice for my bag, that sort of thing. Whenever we play Tecmo Bowl... On your Nintendo, he always loved to be on my team, which would have been fine if it was any good. I haven't heard from Travis or Dave in years. They fell off. The radar, about the same time you did, none of us made. Much attempted to stay in touch, it was just one of those things. That's okay. I wasn't trying to point fingers. It happens. 
but I was hoping you had already heard about Andrew. If you'd gotten a copy of the article, I still haven't been able to get a number or email for Travis or Dave. Maybe they know more about this than we do. Andrew usually hitched a ride with Travis most of the time. It was on the way home for Travis. Didn't Andrew le live with his mom? Like, in an apartment? And his stepdad was a real, real estate broker? Had that one house way out past Highway 6? You remember that? Andrew was scared to death of that house. Here's the article. There's a photo of Andrew with it. Looks maybe like his driver's license photo. Still had messy hair. Gunman shoots too. Kill self and boozy restaurant diners at the roadside breakfast cafe on Interstate 84. Led fled to the parking lot in the park picnic panic yesterday afternoon when a man entered and began shooting patrons inside, cutting two. The couple John, Lucy, and Madison were having lunch when 26-year-old Andrew Hughes entered wielding a Smith & Weston 59 pistol, or the police. When his claimed the perpetrator was muttering to himself as he approached the smoking section and opened fire into the first occupied booth, fatally wounding the Mad Madsons. Soon after, he turned the wagon white weapon on himself. All three were taken to paramedics, so to St. Alphonsus Regional Medical Center where John Mads Madsen and Shooter were pronounced dead. Lucy Madsen, 37, remained in critical condition for several hours but did not survive the night. Police were investigating Hughes' work and personal background, but as of this morning, a motive for the attack is unknown. If there's more to the article, I didn't get it. That's where it was torn off. The other side is part of Diller's ad. It's really bothering me, Eric. What the hell is Drew doing in Boozy with a fucking gun? He hung out with us for almost two years. I just don't get it. Something else is eating at me. I can't figure it out yet. Mark. September 9th, 2004. From Country Mark. Date, Thursday, September 9th, 2004. 2 o'clock p.m. Subject, Andrew. Hey, I know how you feel. It's hard not to think of the times he sat next to us at the table, smiling like a fool, rolling the dice, and moving his pieces around the board. He loved Monopoly Night, always wagged his tongue when he counted money. I don't think he realized he did that. It's impossible to think of him shooting up a diner. Is there a return address on the envelope? No, but the postmark is Idaho, not California or Texas. Not sure if you already considered this, but it's possible. The whole thing is fake. Some sick practical, practical joke made to mess with your head. You can get a newsprint paper for. Yeah, I've considered it. I didn't tell you this earlier, but I called St. Alphonsus and asked they had a patient named Andrew Hughes admitted in the last month. They had no record of him. I asked if they, if it would show if he's been pronounced DOA. Then I got transferred to ER, where they kept paramedic records and info on all DOAs. They have him listed. He showed up on August 28th, died of a gunshot wound to the head. Pronounced dead by ER resident at 3.14 p.m. I asked for some contact info, like a phone or address where he might have been living. I got brushed off, told to call the police for that stuff. The hospital wouldn't give out any personal info, at least not without some signatures. I hadn't called the police yet. That's probably the next step. Glad to hear that you and Connie are going strong. Sorry to sort of dump all of this on you. I just didn't know who else that would care to listen. Alright, if anything else comes to this comes of this. At this point, I'm thinking maybe Drew's mom sent it to me. Maybe Drew kept track of me when I moved to Dallas and had my address. I'm listed in the book that would explain the logistics part. I'm overthinking things. Take care. Mark. September 10th, 2004. 
from country mark date friday september 10th 2004 3 11 a.m subject thoughts and concerns hey again i know it's late or early depending on how you look at it but this andrew thing won't go away i finally realize what's eating at me and i need to spit it out you remember what went on just before Andrew stopped showing up for the game nights at your place? I do. He was gone for two weeks because he had a house sit for his stepfather. Mom and stepdad went on a big vacation every summer. Like for for like ten days, Andrew was just expected to stay behind. He usually just stayed at his mom's apartment, but that year, he was asked to mine that house his stepdad owned. The one out in the old rich subdivision, west of Houston. Maybe the guy had a bunch of houses. He was big on real estate, wasn't he? The guy had inherited his dog from one of his clients. Somebody who moved out and didn't want to take the dog with them. I want to say it was an Australian Shepherd. Do you remember any of this? Andrew talked about it the week before. Dog had behavioral problems. Whined, barked, scratched at the door, pissed on the carpet. Didn't want to be inside always wanted to be outside dad kept it in the kennel instead when it rained except when it rained andrew was supposed to take care of the dog plus a few other things like mow the lawn and that sort of crap crap but andrew didn't want to go dave got into that argument with him about how it was the perfect setup for a younger bachelor House all to yourself, party time, risky business. Andrew kept saying it was too cold there for a party. Too cold. I distinctly remember that and how he kept asking us to drive out and stay with him while he was house sitting. I didn't think anyone went out there, did they? I never did. We didn't see him for two Saturdays in a row. Then Travis picked him up like usual since he was back at his mom's place. That's the one night with Andrew I remember the most. I bet it's the same with you. It was the most bizarre, frustrating night I had with the group. Andrew walked in, quoting some commercial verbatim. I want to say that it was a Tide ad. Travis told us he was, he was like that in the car all the way over. Commercial shows, movies, radio songs. First couple of hours, gaming was like being in a room with a TV on. Then he started parodying us. He just copied something we said. You remember? Tell me you remember this. I, I can see it in my head so clearly. Oh, and what was his response to anyone's complaints? Okay. Drew, stop quoting Law & Order episodes. Please give the Pontiac commercial a rest, dude. Shut the fuck up and roll your dice. Okay. And then he'd launch into something else a few minutes later. It wasn't just that he would regurgitate that crap. It was that... He could take it so far. Whole reams of dialogue and he somehow memorized from one throwaway TV episode. Lyrics to entire songs. It went from odd to funny to disturbing in the first hour. Look, I'll come out and say it. Whatever happened in those ten days, it changed him. It wasn't the same person after that. We all know this. We never talked about it. At least, not with me around. But fuck if we didn't know instantly that the person who came back from the house was not Andrew. I wrote before that I hadn't thought about Andrew since 99. That was a lie. You know your way... Your brain sometimes reminds you of things you hate to dig up. The ones that sour your stomach. I've thought about him a few times. About that night. What was the start of the madness, or whatever it was that drove him to shoot up a diner? Were we there to see him first lose his grip? Jesus, Eric. Why the hell did we say anything? From Country Mark, date Friday, September 10th, 2004, 11.38 a.m. Subject, the door is open. Eric, I woke up to the phone ringing this morning. Turned out to be the reporter from the Idaho... Idaho statesman. She finally called me back. Did I tell you I called to track down the source of the article? She didn't have any new developments on the story, but will continue to follow up with the police. I asked if she had any other other details about the crime stuff 
that didn't find its way into the article. And we sort of went over her notes. Most of it I already knew. But there's one piece of info that caught my attention. She wrote in an article that Andrew was mumbling or muttering to himself when he entered the restaurant. But she didn't put in what he was saying. According to witnesses, he kept repeating, The door is open. Does that make any sense to you? The door is open? Write me back, Mark. September 12th, 2004. From Conjury, Mark. Date, Sunday, September 12th, 2004. 5.10 p.m. Subject, a plan. Eric, I haven't heard from you. Just letting you, writing to let you know. I had... I've had a day to put some distance from the whole thing, and I've made a decision. I'm going to drive down to Houston and see if I can find someone in Andrew's family. I once rode, rode with Travis to, to pick, pick Drew up. I think I know where his mom used to live. From there, maybe I can find his, find his stepdad in the house. I tried Boozy lead already. I called the cops, got more questions than answers. And now some Lieutenant Perez plans to call me back in case he needs more testimony from me. Like I know anything. Apparently Andrew was living al alone in a rental up there. Working at a blockbuster video. That's about all I got from the cops in Idaho. So I'm aiming for Houston. Even driving my own car and... And a cheapo motel. It's still going to cost me about $200 for the trip. Jenny is worried about me. She'd rather I stay and pretend the police will figure this out on their own. But I have to go down there, Eric. Here's why. I think Eric... I think Andrew was afraid of that house for a reason. Whatever that reason was, during those ten nights, something emptied him. Gutted Andrew like a fish. He yanked out whatever he was inside. Or shocked him into forgetting it all away. He was hollowed out. To fill the void, he absorbed any input he could find. Television, radio, conversation. Soaked it up and pretended it was it as Andrew. He could walk and talk and it wasn't injured. Not physically. But he wasn't the same either. There was a gap I need to fill in my head. Like the time in that house. I have these pieces of Andrew that don't match. I need something to match. Hell, I'll feel better if something will just make sense. I won't ask you to fly down and join me. But I could use your help the same. I have some... All the same. I, I have some questions you might be able to answer. Please call me or send me a note if you know any of these. My phone is redacted. What was his stepfather's name first? What was his stepfather's name first to last? What was his mom's name? Was her last name also Hughes? What was the name of the subdivision where his stepdad's house was? I think Andrew mentioned it. I hope I haven't freaked you out too much with my crazy talk. I know it probably comes off sounding absurd, some of it. Or maybe not. You were there for some of this. If you really think I'm off my noggin, tell me. By all means, tell me. Hope to hear from you soon. Mark. September 13th, 2004. From Country, Mark. Date. Monday, September 13th, 2004. 8.22 a.m. Subject free. A plan. Eric. Thanks again for calling. I got your email as well. And it mentions a few things we didn't discuss over the phone. So I want to add a comment or two. What I remember was about Travis told us that time he went went to pick up Drew and had to go up to his room to get him. It was the last time Drew gamed with us. Travis went upstairs to his room and the kid was pacing back and forth by his bed. Everything was all neat and tucked in. But a, the carpet was t was worn in a line where Drew was pacing. Like it's all he did. Yes, I remember this too. And the way Travis told the story. Like he wanted it to sound funny, but he didn't believe it was. And Dave laughed. He said, man, that dude's a broken record. 
And we all agreed, nodding and chuckling. Fuck. We all just let it go at that. Like it was easier to write him off. But Travis was the last one to laugh. He's seen that room with his own eyes. No, I really would, but Connie got sick last night and she's still throwing up this morning. I don't feel right leaving town with her like this. Understandable. You stay there. I'll continue to email you on this thing. I can't really talk about Drew with Jenny. She never knew him. She doesn't get why this is so disturbing, outside of the horror that took the place in Boozy. That's why I keep writing you. Nobody else gets it. Hey, maybe I'll somehow find Travis or Dave while I'm in town. M. September 14th, 2004. From Condry, Mark. Date, Tuesday. September 14th, 2004. 6.51 p.m. Subject, I made it. E. I made it to Houston. The drive was hell. Traffic and a persistent rattle in the trunk wore me down. The AC unit in my motel room sounds like a submerged Cessna engine. It will be hard for me to sleep with it on, and impossible with it off. Well, at least the whole internet access bit works, and I'm able to check my email. Tomorrow's a long day. I'll be prowling Rayswood in your old neighborhood to zero in on an apartment complex I went to once. Joy, wish me luck. Mark. September 15th, 2004. From country, Mark. Date, Wednesday, September 15th, 2004, 9.06 p.m. Subject, lots of stuff. Eric, great news. I have a solid lead. The whole day felt like I was pulling a string from the sand, but it's pointing me in the right direction. These emails are becoming more of a journal for me to help me log my progress. I hope you don't mind. Took me an hour of driving back and forth around the Gessner and Bracewood area before I zeroed in on the right side street. The landmarks had changed. I was 90% sure I found the right apartment complex, but I was still ga grasping air. There was no name for Drew's mom, and no guarantee her last was Hughes. Went to the manager's office, and I just got lucky. Her name is Nancy Hughes. And she stopped paying the rent in September 1999. Drew paid it for the rest of the lease's term, which ended the following February. According to the note in the resident file, he paid in cash. Seems mom moved out or just up and left one day. Poof. Andrew was living alone in the apartment then. How is he paying for rent with just a minimum wage job? I showed the manager the article about Andrew, and then I lied. I said I was a private investigator. I don't know why. Maybe to justify why I was having her dig up rental information from five years ago. Anyway, she got off on it and kept rooting around in the Hughes file for me. Like a movie sidekick. She found something. A third party check covered rent for December of 98. Kurt Malone. I'm thinking this is a step... This is stepdad. The manager photocopied the check for me, and ten minutes later, I was calling the phone number printed with Kurt's address in the upper left-hand corner. No luck there. Disconnected. So I took another approach and called 411 for a local realtor service. You can do a research. You can do a search for contact information for a specific realtor. I remember hearing about this from a co-worker who sold his place in Great Wood. My loan was listed under a. A little Remax affiliate office in Caddy. I got the number and called there. Left message. Evelyn, the owner, called me back and said Malone hasn't worked there in forever. He up and vanished, left her with all kinds of issues. She thinks he had financial problems and bailed from Mexico. I find it hard to swallow a theory she... Sw a swallow theory told me to in stage with whisper. But maybe that's just her personality. It's 
still, that's two people gone. Before I thought maybe mom just moved in with stepdad. Now I don't know what the hell to think. The call went on for half an hour. As I got to hear the HR nightmare, Evelyn went through the thanks to Kurt's disappearance, halting his benefits, freezing the 401k, sorting documents to police, etc. I finally broke in an ex about the house, the one up out in West Houston he owned. She got very quiet after that. It took me another 10 minutes to answer her questions about who I was. This time I was honest and upfront with her. I guess it paid off because she believed me, or at least believed, in my intentions. She checked her records. I have an address, Eric. Kurt had his own home in Sugarland, But get this. He was renting a house from a client way out west, near Pecan Grove Plantation. Paperwork was curious, since he was supposed to be selling this place. But the previous owners had signed off on it in multiple places, like it. Like it was no real conflict of interest. She didn't know what happened to the house after it was seized by the bank. I guess I'll find out tomorrow when I drive out there. I'm close, man. I'm real close. September 16th, 2004. Note, Mark was able to send text messages from his phone, but I frequently received them late. Sometimes hours after he sent them, as as is the case with the, sep with the September tw 21st messages. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 16th, 2004, 3.33 p.m. Subject, no subject. Where are you? Call me! From Conjury Mark. Date Thursday, September 16th, 2004, 8.25 p.m. Subject, the house. Holy fuck, I tried calling you five times today, but I got your machine. I really need to talk. Call me s soon as you can. Where do I start? The house is still there. It's this... Generic one-story thing. Bricks and siding. It must have been built at the same time as other homes in the neighborhood. But it just looks older. The roof is scarred in places. The driveway hasn't held up and others have cracks in the pavement. A plank is missing from the side gate. I rang the doorbell and figured I just talked to the real new owners. No one answered. I couldn't really hear if it worked or not. Blinds and, and curtains and windows kept me from peering inside. There was a dusty pickup truck with a warped front fender parked in the driveway. The neighbor across the street saw me checking out. He talked to me for a while as he watered his shrubs. He hasn't met the person who lives in the house now, or if anyone is living there really. He remembered Kurt, but not by name, just the guy who stayed there for a few months. The previous owner's Kurt clients didn't live there that much longer. They had all sorts of problems in the house, electrical, heating, that sort of thing. They moved out, left most of their furniture behind. Like he said, packed into a big RV one day and just drove off. He still remembered their names, John and Lucy Mad Madsen. September 18th, 2004. From Condry, Mark. Date, September Saturday, September 18th, 2004, 7.59 a.m. Hey, Eric. If you're pay playing phone tag when you called, I was already on the plane. And when I called back, I guess you were at the hospital again. Really sorry to hear about Connie. Any idea what it is yet? Food poisoning? Something else? What are the doctors saying? I'm in Boozy now. Yeah, I had the ticket on short notice. I got on a stand standby. I left my car at the George Bush Airport in Houston. Jen freaked out when I told her. Then she got very terse. Said I should do what will make me happy and hung up. What will make me happy? Christ. I don't 
know a soul in Idaho. I haven't slept in two days. I'm charging everything to my visa. I have no idea how I'm going to pay it off. My watch stopped working yesterday. I get this weird ringing in my radiator. It comes and goes, annoying as hell. I'll tell you what will make me happy. Closing my eyes and not seeing Andrew staring back at me. What are you going to do when you get back back there? Do you plan on telling the police the Madsen connection? Do you think the Madsons left something in that house that drove Drew nuts and he killed them for years later? Seriously, this is fucked up. Yeah, I don't know what to think. Right now, it's just a connection. They lived in the same house. The Madsons were there for, for four and a half months, and Drew was there for ten days. I have no idea what it means. I'll email you, you when I fear something else. Out. I feel like I should pass this along to some people like to get you some help out there, or bring the feds or something. I don't know if anyone else has managed to make the connection you did, and it's an important one to the case. Can I forward your emails and contact info to someone? I was thinking about that but because I was going to ask you to do that for me at first, but now I don't think I'll get that kind of help I need. Let's face it, there are enough unexplainable pieces to this thing. I'm going to get two kinds of interests, nuts and skeptics. I wouldn't mind so much the skeptic, except I get this vision in my head of some guy calling Jenny, calling my parents, calling my boss at work, looking to paint the picture of a guy who's lost his mind after hearing that his dead friend went nuts. I really have been totally honest with Jenny. I really haven't been totally honest with Jenny or my supervisor at the office, because this is not something you can easily explain. I've been calling in sick to work. I told Jenny I had to go to Boozy to attend a, a pseudo wake. I don't want to bite me in the. A I don't. I want that to bite me in the ass while I'm looking f into Andrew's past. Here's what you can do for me, though. You can hold on to the stuff as evidence or whatever if something crazy happens, and I'm in trouble. Use this to explain the situation for me. Forward emails to my friends or family. Maybe if they read them, they'll understand what I'm going through. I know you didn't mean it to inherit this job. I'm sorry to make you do it. But I really appreciate the help. Mark and Potato Land. September 20th, 2004. From Country, Mark. Date, Monday, September 20th, 2004, 10.13 a.m. Subject, new lead. Update, I called the hospital, the one Andrew was taken back in August, and asked some pointed questions about where Andrew's body went. Who picked it up? Did a relative or friend show up? The answer was no, but he was tagged with John and Lucy, and I kept demanding some sort of lead, so the intern gave me the names of relatives who were called in to confirm the IDs of the Madsons and to arrange for funeral home delivery. John's cousin lives out there. I'm going to head out and meet Craig Archer, the cousin and his wife. I'll write again from the Hotel M. From Country, Mark. Date, Monday, September 20th, 2004, 10.40 p.m. Subject, the Archers. Back. That was strange. I met the Archers. I know what you said last time. I called how I need to stop lying because it'll make it harder for on me later, but I wasn't about to tell him I'm a good friend of the guy who killed Greg's cousin. I said I knew the Madsons when they were in Houston. I had some burning questions about what happened to them, as I claimed they practically dropped off the map when they left town. I haven't heard from them since. Greg did most of the talking. His wife Helen was pleasant in that stiff smile way, but she found ways to interrupt my chat with Greg and remind him of other things he needed to get done. The more she did it, the more I encouraged Greg to keep chatting. The Madsons, as he tells it, had a long future plan in Houston. John got a transfer in Schlumberger oil and looked forward to setting, settling down. Then things started to go wrong after they moved in. Just little things that piled up. The car kept getting flat tires. Lucy broke her ring finger. Well, Fussling with the dishwasher, trouble getting mail, 
Their phone got disconnected when they didn't pay the bill for two months. The bill that they never got. That sort of thing. Finally, something Greg doesn't know what. It was enough to get them to put the house on the market the same week. John sold all of his company's stock, got it his 401k, quit his job, and put everything in a big RV. He and Lucy drove off to their new motor home and never looked back. They've been driving around the country for the last five years. Nomadic. Lucy got pregnant to the two, but miscarried. They still kept on the road. Greg thinks they would have kept driving through Idaho if the RV hadn't broke down with an AC problem. Greg says John called him up out of the blue and asked if he and Lucy could stay over. Greg made the guest room upstairs, and he and Helen welcomed them into their house for a week. There was this right before the shooting. This is where he gets stranger. Greg took me to the guest room and pointed to some spots on the carpet. Right in front of the closet door, furniture footprints. Like something had stood there. Greg said this is the dresser. The one against the opposite wall. They barricaded the closet door for the duration of their stay. It was the strangest thing. He also noticed they kept the bedroom light on around the clock. And bundled up the spare set of woolen blankets for the bed. Greg never... Never found the right way to ask no questions. I think he felt a little better talking to me about it. I'm not his cousin, but I'm someone who listened to him and agreed it was bizarre. I left Greg and Helen not feeling any better. I feel worse now. I hate the way way you're sore right before you you get really sick. I'm trying to put things together. I really am. I have to go to police now, don't I? I go first thing in the morning. I promise. Eric. September 21st, 2004. Fun country, Mark. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 2.21 a.m. Subject, no subject. Hey. I just saw this thing on Discovery Channel. Probably a rerun. I bet you can catch it sometime. All about natural predators and stuff. Wild things. Yeah, I'm up watching TV since I can't sleep. Anyway, they had this thing on the Venus flytrap. Talking about how it lures the curious insect to its lip. And then these invisible hairs or something. Since when one of the suckers lands on it. And wham. It swallows the bug. Just like that on it, it spits out the skeleton of the fly and waits for the next victim. Some fly, sometimes the fly trap plants emit this odor to entice more food. Says the voice on the TV. The fancy name for them is Dionea Usipidia. So I wonder if that's all this is. This whole thing with the shooting and an anonymous article in Houston and the footstep prints on the carpet. It's all to get me into the Venus flytrap. Only to send is a sweet sap. It's guilt. Guilt over all the times I was around Drew and didn't do anything to know anything. You know what I mean? And I'm flying all over the fucking country. And my head is buzzing and I think I'm getting close to the truth. But really, I'm ticking, tickling some invisible hair, and the ground is about to fold up on me and swallow me down into the place where Nancy Hughes and Ken Malone went. I'm gonna go take some sleeping pills. I hope Connie is getting better, man. I miss Jen. She has a way of making me feel like I'm at home just by being around her. I'm tired of motels. I'm sorry, Eric. I'm so sorry. M. From Condry, Mark. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004. 12.15 p.m. Eric, bingo. I went to the police and asked to talk to Lieutenant Perez. Instead, I got Detective Slockoff. Sock cloth. He said he was working the Hughes case now. 
I'm more inclined to think he was just running interference for Perez, in case I was a wacko. Anyway, I told him about the Ma Madison connection with Andrew, see if that would help. He said they looked into it. Then he started off with questions about me, and I looked for a way to cut the chat short. Police stations make me uncomfortable. The rest of the talk was rather banal, but at the end of it, almost offhandedly, he asked if I wanted it to sign for Andrew's personal effects, since they had copies of all the important stuff. I said sure, even though it made me feel like I've already written off the off this case. Drew's been busy the last four years. He has driver's licenses for Kansas, Colorado, Arizona, California, and Idaho. Looks like he stayed at friends' homes because none of the addresses <laughs> printed on the licenses have apartment numbers. His Idaho license is, is just two months old and has his address of the rental home where he stayed. I'm going to drop by this afternoon and see what happened to his things there. Maybe there's a clue to, to how he knew where to find the Madsons or why he shot them. Perez or someone has done this already, I'm certain. But I'm not sure he looked very far. Wish me luck, Mark. From removed at messaging.sprintpcs.com Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.14 p.m. Subject, no subject. Standing in front of the house now. It's the same one. The Houston house. Same marks on the roof, same fence damage. From remove messaging sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4 22 p.m. Subject, no subject. Just talked to the old man across the street. He says the house has been here for years, runs it out as far back as he can remember. From removed messaging sprint pcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4 25 p.m. Subject, no subject. I rang the, the doorbell. No answer. It's exactly the same, Eric. I don't understand. From removed messaging sprint pcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4 29 p.m. Subject, no subject. Ears ringing again. I don't know what to do. How is it the same? From remove messaging sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.33 p.m. Subject, no subject. There's a way into the house. Here. From removed messaging sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.33 p.m. Subject, no subject. Where are you? Pick up the phone. From remove messaging, sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.38 p.m. Subject, no subject. I'm going inside. From removed messaging at sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.41 p.m. Subject, no subject. Inside the house. Nobody's here. Air is cold. Metal smell. From removed messaging sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.41 p.m. Subject, no subject. I found stairs going up. Didn't see second story from street. From remove messaging sprintpcs.com. Date, Tuesday, 21st, 2004, 4.47 p.m. Subject, no subject. Did you call? Signal bar, signal cuts off. Three bars, then no bars. I'm looking for more, more of Drew's stuff here. Layout is really bizarre. Lots of rooms. From removed messaging sprintpcs.com. 
date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 4.47 p.m. Subject, no subject. Door at, door at the end of the hall. Made of metal. Check in other rooms instead. From remove messaging, sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.05 p.m. Subject, no subject. Cow. From remove messaging, sprintpcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5.09 p.m. Subject, no subject. Found something. Drew's backpack. Getting out of here now. From remove messaging sprint pcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5 11 p.m. Subject, no subject. I think someone's here. I just heard something. From remove messaging sprint pcs.com. Date Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, 5 77 p.m. Subject, no subject. The door is. Open. 9-27-2004. From Country, Mark. Date, Monday, September 27th, 2004, 1-18 p.m. Subject, for Thursday. Hello, Eric. This is Jennifer. I'm on Mark's PC now. I did like you suggested, and I looked through his outbox, and I don't see any emails about this to anyone else. There aren't that many, really. You didn't tell me a lot of this stuff, Eric. Like now, I'm reading the last thing he sent to you back on the 13th. I didn't know he was so emotional. Why didn't you tell me about this? But anyway, like he said, he wrote to you from his laptop when he was in Houston and in Boise. And then the police up there said that he, f they found that he, in his hotel room, and they're taking their own sweet time checking it out for clues. So yeah, I'll keep asking for that to be sent down. Where else should I look? I don't know what else to do here, except wait until you come down and look at it. He does have AIM, but I can't tell where the chat logs would be saved or anything. If he does that, please tell me what else I can do. You know more about what he was up to than anyone else. Because of his old friend, the two of you had who went crazy, and now Mark is missing for almost a week. Please send me the other emails he sent you. Please, I want to know, I want to know now. Jen. October 1st, 2004. From Postmaster. Date, Friday, October 1st, 2004, 1.30 p.m. Subject, undeliverable mail. Unknown user X. Recipient to general following response. 550 unknown user. Original message follows from x at x dot x. Date Friday, October 1st, 2004, 1247 p.m. Subject, no subject. Human armor and leg bones found its. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on. Human arm and leg bones found at scene on street. Scottsdale residents are got a shock at the start of their morning commute when they found what this what seems to be human bones lying on on the road at Sir Drive. Grand scene technicians arrived within half an hour and began to sweep the scene for more evidence that might help identify this human victim or at least a search an approximate time of death. Police spokesman Danielle Swift said bone evidence alone isn't usually enough to determine identity or even cause of death. These remains didn't just appear on the road. They were they were moved here, Swift said. Therefore, we're asking any witnesses to contact the police with information that might pertain to what happened. No other evidence was found along Sage Street or in yards of neighboring homes. More of the story as it develops. Whoever you are, whatever you are, fuck you. I may not know you, 
But I can tell what this is, and I'm not fooled. Your Venus flytrap game won't work. I'll make damn sure to warn Jenny and the others, too, so nice try. But no one is falling for your bait this time. It stops here. Updates. Updates. It has been painfully obvious that although I want this to end, for all of us to have closure regarding Mark's disappearance, the trail he left has raised too many unanswered questions. Since the time I first published this site for Jen and those close to Mark, new information continues to arrive from a variety of sources. In my last posted email, I refused to take the bait. I said it would stop here, but it doesn't stop there. Not by any stretch. This page will chronicle my findings and other resources as I discover them. Some may have no connection to how or why Mark vanished. Only time will tell. A final note for those of you like Sandra and Nathan Condry. The truth is, I don't yet know what to believe with this whole thing. But I know what I don't want to believe. October 14th, 2004. Jen called. She spoke with Boise police again yesterday. And they finally agreed to ship down the laptop. Once she gets it and looks at it herself, she sends it my way. If I find anything new, I'll add it here. October 17th, 2004. Among the spam today, I have received this email from someone who seems to have stumbled upon the site. From Mr. Paranoia, subject, the house. Very interesting. If it's real, I have some information for you. I don't know, Mark, but I, but that would matter. Once I send you this link, based on what I've researched, those who have figured out what this fly-trapped house is risk becoming its next victim. Not everyone is eaten by it. Such them, maybe. Some may just not be psychologically susceptible to it. The way some aren't able to be hypnotized, but if you walk away knowing too much about it, the house will get to you. Sooner or later, witnesses, witness the Mad Madsons. Maybe you don't want to know anything else. Well, regardless of how I feel about it, this site isn't for me, so in case you read it here first, send me what you have and I'll decide if I want to share it, Mr. Paranoia. Also, don't expect me to publish your messages to me ever again. I am not a PR firm. October 22nd, 2004. After trading email several times with Mr. Paranoia, he finally sent me the link mentioned in the October 17th email. Jen, I've already, I've read it already, and I want you to treat it as a hoax. Unless you get something in the mail from a grocery store in Arizona, call me when you've read it and we'll talk. It's a live journal site, which means to read it chronologically, you need to scroll to the bottom of the page and work your way up. The journal is author allegedly a 16-year-old named Daniela Stevens. Alright. So, before getting into the story, I am going... Cause I am going to read the link. Because the link actually still works. 2004. I haven't been paying attention to these dates. Yes, it's still 2004. Anyways. 10.21 p.m. New job. Hi, everybody. Especially Jonathan, XOXO. Here we go. It's Danny's first LJ. Hee <laughs> hee. Well, it took me long enough. I just need a reason for one. My life is pretty boring for the most part, so trying to keep a diary... Going felt like too much work. Whenever, whenever I get a job, like over the summer, I've always have these great stories to tell. Like when I worked as a lifeguard for the Highland YMCA outdoor pool, or at the public library last year. 
you wouldn't think you'd meet so many weirdo people or end up on crazy adventures like raccoon hunting with the drain net. Hee <laughs> hee. But it happens all the time to me. Well, this time, I will make sure to write them down here because I have a new job. That's right. It's all part of Danny's genius plan to pay for Xmas. I want to get my friends and family nice things this year. So I took a babysitting job at a house three blocks away. Babysitting, yeah. Doesn't sound like a steady job, but this one's different. The Ellisons are both full-time working parents, programmers at some tech company downtown. With big deadlines get close, both of them have to work hella bad OT hours. And I need someone to watch their daughter... Lenny from 5 to 10, Monday through Thursday. And it seriously cuts into my downtime after school. Sad face. But it's worth it. I keep telling myself that. I went over tonight and met Liney and Mr. and Mrs. Ellison. They look like total geeks. Their living room is has a big screen TV and also a table with two PCs and a bunch of other gear like DVD burners. The place is cold. They must run the AC a lot to keep their hardware from overheating. It's like that in the school computer room all the time. Lenny is eight. She's quiet and shy, but she has the cutest crooked teeth smile. She likes Nintendo and Barbie. I think we'll get along fine. My first day is tomorrow. It's so weird to have someone else's, else's house key on my key ring. I guess my references were good for them, though. Wish me luck. Wish me luck. XOXO Danny. 10.55 p.m. First night. Woo, I'm back. First night babysitting was easy. I got there a little before 5 and met Kathy. She's the one who takes money home from school. She has a boy who goes there too. She knew M Mr. and Mrs. Ellison when they lived in Chicago and helped them find a place here. She was in a hurry, I guess, but it seems kind of rude. She told me to be on time so I don't have to wait for you. Sad face. I was on time. I was early. Lenny was still very quiet, but she doesn't know me, so that's okay. We played some Nintendo, and after dinner, she wanted to play house. She has a dollhouse in her room. It's really cute. I grabbed the Barbie doll and started to play with her. But she told me Barbie wasn't the right size for the house. Hee <laughs> hee. It's true, too. Barbie is just way too tall. See that? See what long leg gets you sometimes? But Lenny doesn't have any dolls for the house. She says it doesn't need any because it's just a house. But I think she secretly wants some. If we get along, I might add that to my Danny Xmas list project. Hee <laughs> hee. Gotta remember to take a jacket with me next time, though. It gets way too cold, and I didn't find a thermostat. I was going to say something with Lenny's mom and dad came home, but they showed up and, and they looked so tired. I didn't know how they how they worked with such crazy hours. I just got my money and told them I'd be there tomorrow. That was it. Pretty uneventful first day. So sleepy now. Off the bed. XOXO. Danny. Oh, I forgot to read the current move from last one. The current move from last one is bouncy. This one is sleepy. 10.34 p.m. Bizarre. Tonight was pretty bizarre. Lenny spent most of it in her room playing quietly, which was okay for me since I had to finish my Amer history paper. I made her soup for dinner and checked on her from time to time. But when I, it got closer to bedtime, I heard her talking to someone. So I went to, back to see if she was calling to me or just chatting with her dolls. She isn't supposed to be on the phone. She was moving furniture around in her little house, just talking to herself. I think she was repeating stuff she heard over her, she overheard somewhere, maybe even in a house. You know how kids say stuff they don't realize could get their parents in trouble. I think Lenny was whispering, come on, Rick, answer the phone and the door. Surprise face. Um, Miss Ellison, maybe seeing Rick on the side? When I tucked Lenny in the bed, in bed, I asked her what she was saying before. She just shrugged and said it was stuff she heard. When I asked where she heard, 
them, she said around. We'll see if the plot thickens tomorrow night. Happy face. Off to bed now, Danny. Current mood, confused. Eleven o two p.m. Crooked. Oh, and she, Lenny is such a strange little girl. Last night it was a weird, it was weird faces. Tonight it was a rhyme or some children's song. Something about a crooked man with six pa uh, pants. I don't know. I mean, she can be cute and smiles a lot, but sometimes I worry she doesn't get enough attention from her parents. Well, duh. Otherwise, I wouldn't have this job. Tongue, tongue out emoji. She wanted to go to bed early tonight. I tucked her in and she hugged me. I kept her arms around me for so long. Sad face. She's definitely going to get an Xmas present from me, even if I'm not her sitter by then. I told her a story to put her to sleep about a family of bears in a big house. I was using her doll house as one where the bears live, you know, just improvising. So I looked over at it and saw she had a colored a room upstairs, a red, and marked it up in magic marker. I asked her what the room was, and she just said, said, the one upstairs. Why is it red? And I just shrugged like she didn't know. What's it for? It smells like cookies and candy. See what I mean? Strange, strange, strange. No idea what that's about. Oh, I almost forgot on my way back to the living room. I found a set of keys on the floor in the hall, just lying there. I was like, what the fuck? They weren't mine, and the house keys didn't work on the doors for the house. I don't know how I missed them before. I think they belong to Rick. <laughs> anyway, they ha have one of those grocery keychain cards on them, so I took them. Maybe I should hand them over to Mrs. and Mrs. Ellison. But what if I'm right and the mom is having an affair and he's are to her boyfriend's place? I don't want to get anyone in trouble. This weekend, I'm going to go to the store and have them scan a little key card for me to see who it is. I'll be a good Samaritan and nosy at the same time. John's little brother sacks at the one on Camelback, I think. <sighs> what a week. Finally, I get a week into myself, though. Alright, if I find anything juicy about the keys. XO, XO, Danny. Current mood, curious. 11, 10 a.m. Keys. Well, that was a letdown. Okay, so I went to went and had a keychain cards thing scanned at the fries, which I worked, even though they... They were for another place, because it's all part of the big chain of stores. The keys don't belong to anyone named Rick that, after all. The guy told me they're for somebody named Mark Hondry, I think it was. He lives in Texas. I didn't get them back either. It's possible to have them, have the store mail them back. Whatever. Still makes me wonder what in the world they were doing Mr. Mrs. Ellen's Hall. Hmm. Lol. Listen to me, I'm like Nancy Drew. Okay, off to the mall. John is waiting. XOXO, Danny. Current mood, curious. Ten thirty one p.m. Back on the job. What a weekend. Let's see. I hung out with John. Saw that movie about those South Park guys. And went lipstick shopping because I read this article how lipstick is all undervalued now. Like someone doesn't wear it as often. And I love lipstick. Rebel. Tonight was pretty boring. Lenny was her usual quiet self and spent most of the night watching TV. We watched Aladdin twice and then it was bedtime. The house wasn't cold this time. Maybe that it wasn't that bad since I bought a jacket and kept it on. Oh, I burned dinner. Surprise face. That was frustrating because I know I said it for the right time. So I made us PB&J sandwiches instead. I'm such a mom. Not joking about that. I'm going to tell y'all this one weird part when I was cleaning up in the kitchen after putting Lenny to bed. I heard what sounded like someone barreling down the stairs. Only there was no stairs in Ellison's house. I think it was just the TV or some garage door. Just... Makes a sound like that, because the Ellisons came a few minutes later. Boy, they looked tired. They could have used a, a couple 
Danny Specials, PP, and Jace themselves. I still don't know if I should mention finding the keys that belong to that Mark guy or not. Anyway, time for bed. Danny. Current mood, sleepy. 10.48 p.m. Why am I doing this again? Bleh. I don't feel good. Sad face. I've had a headache for the, for half the night, just pounding on the back of my eyes. I've taken like four Advil already, and it won't go away. Babysitting was a nightmare. I had two papers to write, plus literary homework. Plus, Tuesdays are workout days for me, but I got up late and couldn't work out in the morning, so I sort of squeezed in a quick 20-minute session after school. OMG, Lenny kept singing that stupid rhyme all night and drove me nuts. I swear, if I hear it one more time, I'll snap. I had such a hard time with everything tonight. The house got really cold at one point. Made my ear ring. You know that high-pitched sound like they use for the test of the emergency broadcast system? Yeah, my ear was doing that. I thought it was the computers at first. Did I tell you about the PCs in the living room? Anyway, they, they are always on. I went over and checked them out. The table... Is this like a spaghetti bowl of cables leading off behind furniture or into the wall? Turns out it's not them. The ringing was in my ear, but the Ellisons had some sort of monitoring program going. All these numbers were scrolling like mad on a w in a window. The program wasn't anything I recognized, but the file name was like TMP test slash underscore attic. I didn't want to get in trouble, so I didn't touch them. It got warm in the hall. Lenny and I stayed there for a while. It also smelled good there, like a bakery. I think the vents might be messed up in the house. Seriously, I don't know how anyone can live like that all the time. Sad face. <laughs> I want to quit, but I don't want to hurt Lenny's feelings. Maybe I should suck it up. God, there goes that ringing again. Current mood, drain. 11.31 p.m. Home, finally. It's taken me this long to feel good enough to type. I got home over an hour ago. If last night was awful, tonight was a hundred times worse. I don't know where to start. I got there at five, waved by to Kathy, played with Lenny some. The TV was acting up, so we had dinner early. Made some raviolis with pasta sauce, and it was good. But when I was taking... Lenny's plate, I thought I felt something touch me. It made me jump, and the bowl spilled onto Lenny's shoulder. She had pasta sauce in her air. She asked for a bath, which was fine, but I had not given her a bath before. I was a little uncomfortable because I wasn't familiar with the temp settings on the tub. I didn't know how Lenny's mom and dad would feel about it, but Lenny kept pleading with me to stay with her for the bath, so I ran the water and helped, me, helped her into the tub. The string came out of the faucet and the tub filled up. It made Lenny nervous. I tried to tug on it, pulled it all the way out, but it must have been caught in something inside the pipes. It just dangled from the faucet and floated in the water. Some of the pasta sauce had gotten into Lenny's hair, so I rinsed it out a little. There wasn't any soap in the guest bath, so I went to Ellison's bedroom and brought off some brought off from the master bath. That's when Lenny started screaming. I've never been so chilled to the bone for hearing her tonight. It was horrible hearing her scream. I turned and ran back to her as fast as I could. And when I got back, she was hanging on the edge of the tub trying to get out. The string wrapped around her leg. It yanked and yanked at it, at it again, but it wouldn't budge. And Lenny kept screaming, get it off, get it off. And I started to try to unwind it from her leg. The shampoo in the water or something, it made it slippery and it started... And I started crying, and suddenly, string went slack. I tore Lenny away. She had a set of mark on her, like stripes. Where the string had cut into her skin. Later, there, when I went back with a pair of scissors, the string was gone. The water had drained away. We spent the rest of the night in the living room on the couch. Piled under two blankets and pillows from the Ellison's bed. Lenny eventually fell asleep, but I was worried about her and confused about what happened. I was a nervous wreck. At around 9 p.m., one of the PCs started beeping like crazy. I got up and checked on it. An alert had popped up. It said like that. Then the power cut out and back on again. 
Only some of the lights didn't come on, just light down the hall. In the hall, it was easier to see, but I took a wrong turn on the way back, and the tiny hall and door leads to a garage was not where I thought it was. Instead, I found a set of stairs, like real stairs, going up. It smelled like cake, like right out of the oven. I was so lost and strange. I can't explain it, except I didn't think the house had a second story. It's too hard to see from outside. I finally found a way into the kitchen, and from there I went back to Lenny who was still asleep. It got really cold after that. When the Elsons got home, I told them about the bath and other problems, but I didn't mention the stairs. Then I told them I couldn't babysit anymore. I think I used schoolwork as an excuse. They said they understood, but I could tell they were depressed about it. I'm sorry, but I just can't keep doing it. Well, Miss Ellison asked me to please just make it for one more night, and then they would get a new sitter over the weekend to start on Monday. She paid me in advance for tomorrow, too. I didn't want to say yes. I don't want to go back, but I felt so bad for leaving them on short, short notice. And really, what if it's just me being a spaz? Sad face. Like I'm freaking myself over something. Anyway, I told Miss Ellison, yes. One more night, I can do this. I will come back and out and tell you about the final five hours sitting, sitting for Lenny in that house. And come Friday, I'll talk about something new. Like my friends Don and Kim, or how I love Starbucks strawberry cream fraps, or whatever. Just keep me in the habit of writing here. I think I've gotten pretty good about it anyway. I sort of get on and start typing automatically before I go to bed. Okay, okay, I wish I wasn't so scared of going back. I feel so empty. Danielle. Current mood. Numb. Eleven forty one PM There was a crooked man and he walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence upon a crooked stile. He bought a crooked cat, he caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together in a crooked little house. Red Rover, Red Rover, let Jenny come over. Wednesday, october twentieth, two thousand four. Two o'clock PM Found you. Thursday, October 21st, 2004. Sunday, 31st, 2004. And that's the it of that link. So back to the story. October 26th, 2004. Jen, please call me back. I know it must be driving you crazy, but do not go to Phoenix. Mark was never there, despite what Postmark says on that box. The keys are just like the article about Andrew. Bait. Please, please don't do this. Send me the laptop and we'll figure, this out, figure it out together, okay? I won't have to put this here if, you, if you'd answer your phone. I know you visit this page regularly. Call me. 10 October 26, 2004. Late. Lots of responses. I didn't expect this. Thank you for your support and your technical notes. At this time, I cannot involve and will not involve anyone else for a number of reasons. Please respect my decision on this matter. I'll keep the contact information and the paranormal investigators for the paranormal investigators and I'll continue to help those close to Mark as best as I can. Please, no more phone calls. Connie is going out of her mind. Thank you. October 27th, 2004. Sandra slash Nathan. Check your email. I finally heard back from Sprint PCS service representative today. No more account authorization hassles. He said the records show that have been billed for only for 14 text messages on Mark's phone on September 21st. The last one timestamp at 5.11 p.m. He's sending me a copy of the logs, but I'm not sure if they'll do us any good at this point. I'm waiting on laptop now. October 28th, 2004. I've been contacted by Diane M., who says she was friends with Lucy Madsen when she lived at Houston. Hello, Eric. A friend linked me to the site asking 
If this was the same Lucy I knew when I lived in Sugarland. After doing some reading, I convinced it is. I had no idea what happened to her. After she and John moved, Lucy and I met through a little book club. Some mutual friends started up. We were both avid readers. Yes, she and John had all sorts of unexplainable problems with that house. I remember seeing some of them firsthand, like the leak. After reading about your friend Mark, I stood up a bit and called, then called up my father. I often talked with Lucy on AIM when she lived here, and I thought maybe some of those old dialogues would be of use to you. But they would have been my old PC, which I gave to my dad. Oh, a year ago. I went over earlier tonight and dug through the program files, files for any sign of my AIM chats with Lucy. Way back when, Dad had removed a lot of stuff. He deletes things. But I did find a scrap from February 1999. It's the one I remembered. The one that made me curious to visit. Note, I don't really think it's a supernatural thing. I'm more prone to think Lucy had some sort of nervous breakdown and created or imagined traumatic moments in a house. The rest of it, like your friend's experience, I can't explain, but I hope you find closure soon. The attachment would, wouldn't open, but hopefully Diane will try again. Update, I got the chat log converted it to HTML. I don't know if Diane is still using her screen name, or if Lucy is taken by a new user now, so to protect both from unwarranted IMs, I removed the numbers of the ends of their NICs. If there are any users with the NICs in this log, they are not the same people, FYI. Let's see if this works. Nope. That link does not work. Oh well. October 29th, 2004. Laptop arrived. There's a lot of lot to sort through here. Most notably, some pictures Mark must have downloaded from his camera phone. But his laptop was e wasn't equipped with Photoshop or any other photo app, so I can't see more than thumbnails. I'll move them to my hard drive along with recent files and see what I can find. Also, it's crunch time at the office, so I'll be working this weekend, FYI. Maybe we could all use a little mental break from this. October 31st, 2004. Hooray for automated FTP uploading. It seems this publication... It means I'm still not back from my trip in, to the never-ending suburban grid in the valley. Consider it a precautionary update. When I return, I will remove this link, and since I can't stand sounding like some sort of martyr, nor do I like to cause a panic, in the meantime, in case it would wind up being important, I've been keeping a personal blog on a remote host. Don't worry about me, Connie. I'm sure I'll have quite a story to tell. Love, E. October 1st, uh, 4th, 2005. This is Connie. It's been nearly one year since Eric drove off and never came back. I don't know how to do HTML. I don't know if this is how Eric did things. I'll be good doing, I'll be doing good just to copy this page back onto the website. What happened in a year? A lot. Not enough. I don't have any answers, just a million questions. Let's see, I met Jennifer and Rachel, who's Cam's girlfriend. The three of us still kept in touch. Legally, Eric and Mark and Cam are considered missing. That makes some things very hard on us. What else? I have a mountain of files, emails, letters, digital photos that may or may not not have anything to do with their disappearance. Every time I try to start in it, start in, I get overwhelmed. So last week, I hired someone to go through all of it for me and see if anything made sense. The reason I'm finally learning this thing is that he f has found one or two pieces to this puzzle, and I feel responsibility to continue what my husband began. This is a test post later this week. 
after I hear back from Jenny, I will post more information. X Z O C. October 12th, 2005. Well, for one reason or another, the new information is yet to be verified. So until I hear back from my source, I can't post a link. Now I can get how hard this is. You never know who is on the other end of a modem. Thanks for your patience. I love you, all three of you who are still reading. X zero C. October 14th, 2005. Despite the fact that sh she just used her diary to lash out at me instead of answering me privately, I will link to a live journal of a woman who claims to know about what both Mark and Eric were investigating. Edit. Okay, I'm still figuring out the link thing. Ho the blog of Lauren Mathers. Hoping that works. X0C. And it does work. So we got more story. So that was the end of that. So let's listen to the journal. I'm back. January 17th, 2006. Oh, wait. Hold on. Oh, yeah, I gotta read backwards. I'm sorry. You must hear the, hear the truth. August 16th, 2005, 12.40 p.m. My name is Lauren Ma Mathers, and I don't know much about the internet, and I don't care to. The reason I am this so-called internet diner in old downtown... I ain't about to tell you which city. Thank you kindly. <laughs> sorry about that. Is because there's no record of what I did... In October of 2001. Not anymore. I killed a man. Killed him dead. Thing of it was. He was trying to kill me first. I don't take too kindly to that sort of behavior. At the time. I was in another state. From one of my last known address. A tourist. Never mind. I had all my shit. In the back of my station wagon. And a revolver in my glove box. To anyone else. I was a visitor from out of town. So was the man I shot to death. He wasn't local either. See, we both were from Mosey. There was a trial. There were lawyers and all that shit. And I would have been happy to serve my time in a cell for what I'd done. One of the safest places for me would be considering what I know. But the damn lawyer got me up on the chair next to the judge. Asked me why I did what I did. And I told him. I told all of them I went on for 11 pages in the court transcripts, laying out everything I know about it. And my big mouth j got me just nine months in a mental facility. Nine months. Like my delusion was a pregnancy. And once I had it out of me, I could go free out among the world. Now I'm out. Been out for... For a few years. I still carry a gun on me too. And I'm not afraid to kill again. If cornered. Maybe I've walked right past you. But I guarantee you didn't pay a cent of attention to me. And that is the way I like it. I would have stayed that way. Never go into one of those coffee places. With computers hooked up. On the tables like they were Jetsons. Because anyone who wanted to know the truth. Just had to read the court transcripts. It was all there. But they're gone. Disappeared from Boozy Police. Man named Mark Condry came looking for them. Then calling for me. That's how I know. Used to be you could type my name into the search engine and things like wa Wahoo. And my name w would get you these news stories about shooting in Salt Lake City. Matters nothing. Well, I aim to put a stop to that. I'm going to tell you what happened. And also what happened to the fellow Mark. And a slew of other names you may not recognize. The first thing I can tell you is this. They aren't houses. Stop thinking of them like houses. Soon as I get a panhandle enough money for another hour on this bitch box, I'll be back. LM. New Town St. Lorraine. September 20th, 2005, 11.33 p.m. 
All it took was one entry on his journal thingy, and I had a man in a sweat sweatsuit come trawling downtown for me. It took me a, a good week to make sure I had shaken him loose. Now I'm in a different place, new Jetson Cafe, and I got a new shopping cart from Target down the street. It's a good cart, got smooth wheels, no pulling to the left or right, no squeaking. I just need to find a good place to sleep tonight. So, Papoos, we... I best get to to that now before someone finally catches up to me. And now it's really just a matter of time before I, I'm dragged through the front door of a house that smells like fresh bread and warm blood. But as I said, they aren't houses. Here's what I know and what I said to everyone in the courtroom. It started with the little things. This was a week after I moved in, summer before my first semester teaching. The sound traveled in odd ways, especially in the kitchen. No echo, even in empty rooms. Now and then I felt... Now and then I thought I felt the carpet wriggle under my feet. The outlet things, they felt... I don't know how to put it. I guess soft is the word. Like I was jamming that plug into a jar of jelly. Platter, power fluttered a lot, but damaged if I could find a fuse box. The thermostat didn't seem to care how much how I bustled with it. The air just came on when I wanted it to. The rest of the time it was warm and smelled like cinnamon toast. All of this feels par for the, for the course when you buy a home at auction. I got in on one of those deals where the bank offloads all the real estate they reclaimed from defaulted loans or some shit. You get what you pay for? Not this time. Not even close. I try again into the attic to see if there's anything like a fuse box there. I search all up and down the house for a trap door to the crawl space. No sign of it anywhere. So I did what any... Any self-respecting middle-aged one would do. I went out and bought an axe. As soon as I jammed the axe into the hall ceiling, it all started going to hell. Shit, internet cafe guy is shooting me off. Be back when I can. Continue from last entry. October 4th, 2005. 8.21pm. Let's try this again. Last two times I got on here, I was halfway through typing new entry when I got kicked out for smelling bad. But late last night, I stuck into a condo, took a bath on their rooftop pool, and changed into fresh clothes, clothes and bought. I bought at a thrift store. Getting right back to it, the house bled. Not like red human blood, but something else. It got into my eyes when I chucked that axe into the ceiling. Went to the kitchen and wiped my eyes with a towel. When I went back to the hall, the trap door had suddenly opened from the ceiling. And a set of steps of stairs extended to the floor. Like I, I had a whole second level or something. I couldn't see up past the threshold. Not because of the angle. But because it was so damn dark. At first I thought something black and large was blocking. The way up, but it wasn't an object. The smell was most bizarre, a thick, heavy scent of sweet and baked goods, and I was trying desperately to draw out the stench of rotting meat, made me quincy, queasy. And I wanted to go up there. No, that's not entirely true. I didn't want to go, but at the same time, I had this urge to step up the stairs. Like, that's what happens next. I needed to keep going, maybe just poke my head in and look around in all that dark. I started arguing with myself about it. And by the time I finally listened to the scream in my head, I was already two steps off the floor. I turned and ran fast as I could for the front door. The hall was making these weird noises overhead, and the walls crack crackled like I was in an old clipper, clipper ship out at sea. The knob on the door wouldn't turn, and my heads were all sweaty by now. I tried kicking at the goddamn thing, but it was no use. The door would not open. Behind me, I heard these loud sound like a chorus of fat men sucking on their teeth. I came from somewhere in the middle of the house. I wasn't going to try and pass the stairs to the sliding back door in the back. 
it was out front or not at all. I grabbed the chair from the little dining area and bashed it against the picture window and looked out the front yard. Let me tell you, I swung that thing like the bases were loaded. I am no wimp. I once took down a f guy a full foot taller than me outside a bar. And that was when I was a little tipsy. But damn if that, but damn if that window didn't break. Here's what it did. It stenched. Stretched. It stretched like it was made of see-through skin. That skin bounced back and cracked me in the skull hard. And I was left bleeding from my scalp. A real gusher. The carpet in the living room started swaying like it was grass and a breeze. And the smell started filling up with up the front of the half of the house, making me wonder why I didn't walk up the stairs in the first place, making me think the best bet now is to go up and see if there's a way out from the attic. And it took some miracle for me to find my way to the kitchen with a bloody face, hands scrambling for the towel again. What I found was a bread knife, those serrated ones with a fork end. I made it like I was going back to the living room, then dove at the window again, screaming like a banshee, and, and I fell right onto the porch outside. It was like the window just opened up ahead for me. The knife was Moses, and the glass was the fucking Red Sea. That's how I remember it, stone cold truth. What really did the trick was what I found when I went back two days later. Formulas. October 11th, 2005. 10.46 a.m. Vomit notes. If body fresh, eaten by house less than 12 hours. Strings attached. If body cooked, inside mouth for more than 24 hours. No strings visible. If body stale, too long time inside mouth. Bones. Physical strings range small, just within house. Can't go outside. Very, very fast movement. No strings, able to go outside. Perform basic tests, slower, used as lure or bait. Bones digested in fluid for too long, or house gets hungry. Warning signs, open sore or nape of neck. Last string disconnects from there. Repeat, repeats phases, unusually strong or weak. Connection theory, potentially all same house. T slash S anomaly, multidimensional, beyond human understanding. For Connie, October 13, 2005. Well, I was going to pick up where I left off last week, but I had to wade through four email from some woman before I could get here. I don't have time to respond to all of them. This bitch botch costs me money. Money I, I should be spending on booze or coffee. My lifeblood. Look, Connie, or whoever you are, I don't give a shit if you believe me or not. It's not my mission to validate my existence for you or your little project. Yes, I did talk to M Mark Condry. I'm getting to that. As for proof of whatever you're looking for from me, did you not read the bottom entry here? The proof is gone. I can't even prove if I was a resident in Idaho anymore. Either you believe me or you don't. Pull up a link if you want to. Get the word out. Let people decide for themselves. No way in hell am I going to meet you somewhere. I didn't survive this long by being stupid. If you want, I can describe Mark for you. I can do that much. I'll send you that your way. As for my last entry with the formulas, I just want to get that written down before I forget. I'll talk about that more later. Some of it is speculation. Some of it I've seen with my own eyes. I'm not playing tic-tac-toe, so none of this is exo shit. LM. I'm back. January 17th, 2006. 11.46 p.m. Three months and five states later, I got news, kitties. So sit down and hear me out. Okay, first off about what I was saying earlier. Before that woman contacted me, and I suddenly got popular. I mean, about my house. You know, that was my house. Maybe that's just how we Americans operate. But once I put a payment on anything, that sucker's mine. So after two days, I done came up with a few conclusions. The first of which was, I didn't really see what I thought I saw. 
it was a monoxide leak or I got sloshed at some episode. Two days in a motel was plenty for me to work up the old courage to go back. Somebody was living in the house, in my house. Two somebody's turned out, twin brothers, my stuff was there. At least the furniture, I could see it through the windows. But they were living it up like nothing was wrong. The window I thought was busted through was replaced and everything looked almost normal. But damn, if you don't know what to do when you come home and find two strangers living in your home, I wasn't even bothered that, that they could be out and out to kill me or something. You know what worried me? That they were going through my stuff, putting their grubby paws all over my music, CDs, my underwear, sleeping under my covers. Damn it. I would have stayed outside just watching them move around like shadows behind the drapes, but then this nest of blackbirds made a racket fly, flying out with a little elm tree in the front yard, and I could see those twins in the window staring at me. Then the front door opened like someone was finding me inside, but no one was there. And someone in the worrying brain said, No monoxide leak, no drunken nightmare, move your ass. So I listened and I bailed. I left my CDs and my clothes and my fucking house behind. A few months later, one of the brothers found me in Utah, and I had to kill him dead. Now I had, I got some out of that out of the way, I need to tell you important information. Enough of the history, I'm your secret agent out in the field, getting you the files you need to stay alive. Theory, somebody had to start building these things, right? I started snooping around, here's what I found out. Get your pencils out. Near as I can tell, the original designer of the floor plans was a man named Jared Lewis. He tore down his old house in Topeka and built a new one on top of the foundation. Family left him at some point in the process. Okay, but there's more. Lewis was an old student or disciple of some nut named Jack Pier Parsons. Man, oh man, is there a ton of background on Parsons. Too much to go into here, but this Lewis guy went after his home building project like he was a land-based Noah. So I'm still collecting information on his Jared Lewis and his little group of followers. I should also have some goodies like an actual floor pan, maybe some photos of the house, assuming I get up the courage to visit one in the city where I'm squatting now. Damn, gotta go talk more later.